Aloha, everyone, and welcome to my Orchid Club meeting. That's right, I decided to bring all of you along with me. I am a member of the Mililani Orchid Club, and the speaker for tonight is Larry Yamamoto. He is going to be talking about how to grow Vandas. Larry became a full time orchid grower about 12 years ago after retiring from his job. So I hope you find today's video not only entertaining but also educational. Do you mind if I don't use the mic? If I talk really loud, is this okay? Yeah. Because it's kind of fuzzy. Okay. okay. So if you don't mind, I'm not going to do it. It's a more Okay. Little background. Bernard talked me into this because actually we started going uh, to, with the Cunea Club to be out in trips and all of this other stuff. And so since he asked me, I normally don't do this, um, but, <laughs> but uh, since he asked me, I, I agreed to talk about uh, tonight Vandas, I guess. And what I was, the plan is, I'll talk a little bit about Vandas, different kind of stuff, and then I'm going to <coughs> transplant this Vanda into this thing I call an air pot, and I'll explain why and how and all of that, okay? So let, let me first start talking about Vandas in general. Um, if the people who classify and name orchids have been doing a lot of name changing over the past uh, five years or so. So the stuff that I remember as like Neophonicia and all of this are now Vandas, and so on. the names are all different. So I usually fall back to the old names. So if I'm calling something that's out of date, please like forgive me or anything. But they're all different kinds of Vandas. Um, these are more or less strap leaf Vandas. They're a little bit broader leaf. Um, I noticed one in the back looks like a semi terrique Vanda. It's a little narrower leaf can handle the sunlight better. But there's a bunch of different kind of Vandas. Uh, <coughs> this, this is uh, Vanda Luzonica. Uh, the species Vanda, probably from the uh, Philippines, right? The name, right, and everything. Um, and, but they all actually prefer different levels of light and different growing conditions. But with a couple general things. First of all, Vandas are uniformly epiphytes. They grow on trees. They kind of uh, evolved growing on trees, so they have specialized roots. You've seen these roots, they're really fat. It's got this uh, thing called a velamen surrounding the inner hair, which is the root. This is an outer coating. And what this does is store water and nutrients for the plant. And so it can live growing on a, a branch or something. So it's evolved these specialized roots. That affects how you grow them and how, and how I how I pot and transplant them. <clears throat> Vendas are called um, monopodial growth habit. So they, they grow, basically, they grow up, single up. But you notice like this one, they, have, they do have cakeys, mm -hmm. but each plant just grows straight up. That affects how you transplant them. Like Catalias grow sideways, they crawl out of the pot. Vendas mm -hmm. just get taller. <clears throat> like this, it's just going to keep getting taller. It might throw a kiki on the bottom, but it's going to keep getting taller. And what happens eventually is, as it gets taller, it, it produces roots along the stem. And so pretty soon you have this tall plant with roots. And so all you do is basically cut it off and then transplant it. These were all transplanted not that long ago. I think this one was about three, four months ago. And this one a couple months ago from a bigger plant. These are like cakey from the main plant. This one was uh, from a plant that was had like six or seven cakey growing. This particular one is a hybrid, a radius by Vanda, a hybrid, and it has a propensity to grow these cakeys. And so what it happens eventually is you start cutting them up and then you get a bunch of them. Um, I bought this at the Windward Orchid Show not that long ago, a couple of weeks ago now. It came in a pot with bark. And a lot of times you'll see that when they're young, they're growing bark because the, the nurseries can uh, water them less because their bark holds moisture, the roots hold moisture. So you can like water them maybe once a week with bark or something like that. But 
what happens is the bark begins to deteriorate and they start to rot and it actually doesn't like it. Again, these are epiphytes, right? They grow on trees. They like it airy like this. And so this kind of mimics growing on a branch or something in this plastic basket. Right? <coughs> so specialized roots can have the air that it likes better. <coughs> so vaniculture really is, is, is growing it that way, recognizing that it's an epiphyte, providing it with the air, movement, and water. Um, one of the, there's like four really growth factors that uh, I consider, well actually all orchids you need, you need to consider, but with the Vandas, um, there are four growth factors. One of them is temperature. Now, in Hawaii, and with Vandas actually, temperature really isn't that much of an issue. But in Hawaii, temperature is elevation. The higher up you go, the colder it gets at night. Um, there's certain Vandas, like the Vanda cerulea, it won't bloom in lower elevations because it doesn't get cold enough. It needs a cold snap to bloom. This particular one, is a hybrid with Vanda cerulea. It's three quarters Vanda cerulea. But because it's a hybrid, I can bloom it in, in Milan. So temperature does play a factor. If, if you have a, a Vanda cerulea and you live in Never Beach, it'll probably never bloom. So, um, so you need to be aware of that. <laughs> it might, it, well, I shouldn't say never, because you never know what kind of, it can be, strange things can happen, but it'll probably be really poorly blooming if it does bloom, because it just doesn't get cold enough. Uh, so temperature does, is an important factor, but I notice with vendors, it's not as important as say with like cymbaliums or some of these other orchids that temperature is more important. The vendors really is not the only one that I know of that has this cold, the need for cold temperatures that would make, require it to get cold for it to bloom. There are other things that actually, um, that I have other orchids that have that more predominant in their mix. The other three are, to me, really important for vandals. That is light, air movement, and water. Okay. So light is one of the most important things, uh, in my opinion, for growing vandals and blooming them. Because you don't want to just grow the plant and have it just sit there green, right? You go, I, especially me, I I'm a flower person, so I grow them because I like Vanda flowers. Like these big colorful flowers that the Vanda produces, that's kind of why I grow Vanda. And they bloom best when you give them the maximum light within its tolerance. Okay? So light is very important. And Thank you. So, um, like in this particular case, strap leaf vandas actually probably grow the happiest at like maybe with 40% shade, like in a greenhouse with 40% shade, 40, 50% shade. It seemed to grow, to grow the best uh, there, that way, that light. Like this particular one, this uh, Vanda Luzonica, um, in particular, this particular plant, if you try to grow this at anything more than like 50% shade, it'll burn dark black splotches on it. This other Vanda, uh, <coughs> Garnet Beauty, actually is more tolerant of light. So though there's still strap leaf Vandas, this particular one, the Luzonica, is less tolerant of that light. Now, Normally, when I, when I get an orchid like this, it's grown in a greenhouse, it's probably like 50% shade, and as, as I, it's bigger and, I, and I, it gets uh, older, the roots begin to really extend far beyond the pot. And the pot keeps growing, right? Monopedial, just keep growing, and the roots get long, and so I have this in my greenhouse, but because I have a small greenhouse, I can only hold so many plants. Eventually, it just gets too big. And so that's when I put them into these other pots. Now, one of the problems uh, with putting them into a pot is the air movement, which is the other important thing. Epiphytes grow on uh, uh, branches. The roots hang down. Lots of air movement. They develop roots, especially so that they can tolerate that with the velaments coating to hold nutrients and moisture. 
You put them in a pot like this one was with bark, the roots will start to rot quickly. And so <coughs> I came across, I was in a dilemma. I had these vandas, I liked the flowers, but they would get so big that I couldn't walk around in my greenhouse, right? <coughs> so a, a friend of mine, Leland Nakai, who is actually really the expert, I just copy him. Um, <laughs> but he actually started putting them in pots in the, uh, initially and drilling holes. Now, so what, <clears throat> what we kind of developed in concert, the, both of us together, is these, I call them air pots, but they're basically just an empty pot <clears throat> with holes drilled in the side. So there's no medium. It mimics growing on a branch because you have this PVC brace that you put into the pot to mimic like a branch, and then the roots just grow down from it. So it mimics a kind of epiphyte growth habit. But then if in a pot like this, I could stack them up on benches in my yard. So I grow these in my yard, full sunlight. They normally don't like full sunlight. Like you see this one is discolored, it's a little yellow. It's not green like this mosaica, which can't handle that. And the reason is they're at the edge of their probably light tolerance. But they bloom really well at that high light. <coughs> okay, so, so, and I can have more plants because my eyes is bigger than my greenhouse. I don't have enough room. I got to put them someplace. So I put them in my front yard. I have benches, you know, uh, actually shelves that I cut the legs to about less than a foot and have them in my front yard, and I put these on the bench. And so now, I can afford to get more plants. <laughs> so so I, that's why we developed this way to do it. And actually because we discovered that if you press the edge of its light acceptance, it can still grow. They're not gonna look as pretty green like mm -hmm. this, um, but they'll bloom actually more light. All right, so it actually uh, helps because I like the, the flowers anyway, it really kind of helps that way. So, but the, the, the one drawback in doing this is when you transition a plant from like a greenhouse, 50% shade to full sunlight, you cannot do it in June. If you take the plant out of 50% shade and put them in full sunlight in June, it'll just burn. Yeah. So there's a period of the year that you can best accomplish this. It's like between maybe November and February, March, so October, November, depending on the year, the light intensity is, is diminishes because of the cloudiness and other things, and actually, because of our latitude, the light intensity is less, so it doesn't burn as much. And then if you do it early, by the next summer, it can tolerate it without burning. Now, it's, again, it's gonna be probably at the edge of its light tolerance, but it'll survive and you can then buy more plants for your greenhouse, right? So, <laughs> so, <clears throat> so that's really the reason that uh, I, we kind of did this. So the PVC brace is very easy to construct. It's just PVC. I mean, if I can do it, anybody can. It's, uh, it just takes the PVC glue and everything. And, and I measured it so that it fits within this, this pot here. And all you gotta do is measure this part and, and cut it to the length and then stick it in. Now I, I use elbows and tees so they're open on the bottom. And the reason I do that is the, that way the water that gets in here drains out. Now, there's, you can get stuff that crawls in here though. So the geckos and slugs can get in here. So you gotta be careful about that. So you gotta keep it, you gotta know that and keep it clean. But it's better than having say a, a plug here at the end because then the water's going to get trapped and it's going to get stale. So I let it so that at least can come up. So that's why I, I built it this way. Now, one of the other things that's important um, that I found anyway with, with Vandas, um, as far as orchids go, Vandas are relatively fast growing. They grow pretty well, and it's maybe because I have them pushing the envelope of light. Um, and I give them water. I water every day in the morning. Uh, I like to do it in the morning because then it has all day to dry up. Then I can water again in the morning. Now, when I was working, it was pretty hard because I used to go to work really early in the morning. But uh, it's still, it's best to water them in the morning. And, and with water, 
and I'm talking about, I live in Mililani, Mililani tap water. Now, um, Mililani tap water is hard water, actually, right? You know, that. There's other water that people use reverse osmosis water, where they re remove some of the hardness from it, and then rainwater. Those are the options that are most common. But being lazy, I, I actually just use the Mililani tap water. Now, that means that when I water, I water to provide water for the plant, but I'm also watering to flush salts. So when you use tap water, you have to water, and I go through tw at least twice. I water the first time to get it wet, and I water the second time to flush salts. Um, salts from the water and salts that you add from fertilizers and other things. So if you use tap water like I do, um, you have to use a lot of water. Um, water conservation in this case doesn't really apply. Right? So, so the water, water supply probably doesn't like me saying this, but actually I use probably more water than I would otherwise. Now if I use rainwater, you don't really need the splashing as much because there's not as much um, hardness in the water. But um, because I use the regular tap water, um, it's important to water a lot. You gotta make sure that you really flush it. Now, the other thing I discovered is that they respond real well to fertilization. If, if you give them good light and good water, if you fertilize regularly, and I fertilize every week, I, I, would, I would start with like a, a teaspoon per gallon of these orchid fertilizers, and I, I use all three. Um, there's no real reason. I just went, wow, this looks good. I started with this. <laughs> went on the city mill, oh, orchid fertilizer, this looks good. I started with this, and then I went to Lowe's and I discovered these two. But I noticed that there's a difference. And again, I've got to say, I stress this, Fandas respond well to fertilization. So if you fertilize regularly, if you have plenty of sun and plenty of water, they'll, they'll bloom regularly. This, this Island Supreme Orchid Special, um, really popular with a lot of orchid growers, its primary source of nitrogen is uh, the nitrate nitrogen. Okay, and it has some ammonia nitrogen. But nitrate nitrogen needs to be converted to ammonia to be used by a plant. Okay, 13 to 13. Nitrate, nitrogen. These two uh, orchid fertilizers, and it's like an AOS kind of sponsored thing that I bought at Lowe's. They have a good portion of their nitrogen, ammonia nitrogen, mm -hmm. readily available to the plant immediately. Mm -hmm. So the, the, you, you actually see a response to these two more, uh, more quickly than you do this. But the part of the difference, and the reason I do all three is, the micronutrients are different in the tree. Mm -hmm. And with all orchids, and with vandas included, micronutrients are really important. Mm -hmm. And one of the things about these air pots is, you know, people talk about using NutriCoat and other things mm -hmm. for their orchids. Well, NutriCoat's not going to work in this, because there's nothing to hold the vitamin, it's going to come right oh, off the bottom, right? Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but that's, so, that's why with the vandas, I use these liquid fertilizers weekly, uh, one teaspoon per gallon of water, and then I apply it. Now, because I do it weekly, again, that's why another reason why I water so much is to flush the salt. Because, like I said earlier, these specialized roots absorb the nutrients. So they're, they're in development, and when you water, you're only watering the stuff that's outside the development, right? So you're watering the excess. So that's why I water a lot, because um, once it's absorbed into the vellum, you're not going to wash that away. So you just wash away the stuff that's outside. And you know, fertilizer solutions can get into the leaf areas and stuff. You probably want to wash that too. Okay. So, um, so it's important with vandas, um, maximum tolerable light, air movement, um, plenty of water, and then fertilize regularly. Now, that being said, I'm going to try to transplant this one that I brought. 
it's really simple. Um, that's why I'm willing to try it here. Hopefully not too, too stupid doing it. Um, oh, I forgot to mention. The way to make these holes is this thing called a hole saw. Hole saw? A hole saw. Yeah. It comes in a kit like this, but basically it's just a saw blade that you put on a spindle. And you can cut the plastic right out of here in one piece. So um, I started out, when I first started doing this, I was worried that cutting out these holes would weaken the pot. So I started with these little holes, see these small holes? But over time I realized that it's not, the roots hold up everything together and, and the whole, big holes are better, more air movement. So my newer pots have bigger holes. And so. In fact, you, can, you, know, you could mimic the basket almost as much as you can, right? That's what, basically what you're trying to do is mimic the basket um, with this pot. But you still have to have a good pot. Yeah. Um, the, some are more flimsy than others, but get the, get the, the thicker, and this is a five gallon, thicker five gallon mm -hmm. pot. The brace tends to make it a little more firm, you know, because it, basically I screw it into here, right? Just drill holes and I screw it right in. And then, so it makes it a little stronger. So there's some pots, plastic pots that are, are really pliable. Um, they're probably not as good as this, but you know, I noticed that, like in this case, this thing fills up with roots. So strength is really not an issue with the pot. Uh, in the beginning, it's a, it is because there's only a few roots, like. Like this one, I think I was maybe a month or two ago. It's really a lot of air. In here. So it's starting out. When you first transplant it, when you cut it off of the, the mother plant and you transplant it, the roots, there's a few roots, but uh, not that many. So when it starts out, there's a lot of air. But as it starts to grow, it, it, it continually adds and adds. Pretty soon, it's, it's filled. I just cut this off yesterday. It was a much taller plant. I cut off a bunch of leaves, and, and, it's, and I, it's a, this and it's this color because I have it sitting in water. Because what you want to do is make the, the roots as soft as possible, because you want to minimize the loss of roots when you're transplanting. So if it's soft as possible, what you can do is you can stuff this in here. Right? Mm -hmm. So you got you're just gonna bend and twist and all of this stuff. So you want it wet because then it will hopefully bend without breaking as much. But it's, again, all you're trying to do is stuff these roots in without breaking them. I mean, inevitably there'll be casualties though. And then I use these plastic pots. Cable ties. Simple. So how long were the cable ties? I got all different lengths. All different lengths. Because sometimes you, you got to, you know, just bend. I mean, it's got to twist around stuff. And, and so, I, what, you know, I, I have several different lengths from the real long and skinny ones to the, the shorter ones. But that's, that's all I use is these cable ties. What if it's windy? Excuse me? What if it's windy, windy? Um, Go in your house. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, it was windy right a few weeks ago. It was really windy. Yeah. yeah. Um, there is a there is an issue with that, and I'll, let me let me finish this. 
before it gets away from you, and then I'll explain a little bit more. Um, now, what food to your bench? You can't even get it off the bench. <laughs> <laughs> when I have some on the trees, they don't come off the tree. <laughs> okay. Um, so basically, pow. Mm. Yeah. Now, windy, so you put a big rock inside. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, in the beginning, the rock is important because um, it, it does easily blow because no roots in here yet, right? Yeah. So we put the rock in here, and then actually it's stable. But the trick to me is um, because I, they're all about the same size, they're the same size. I, I buy clamps at, at Walmart. I clamp these two together. The nook and tip over. So then I put another one in here, right? I put this one over here. And I clamp it together, and then for sure not going to come. So all you do is I use those plastic clamps, mm -hmm. and then you clamp three in a row. And during the wind, not, nothing turned over that was clamped. Several that I didn't clamp fell over and all of that stuff. But because uh, the idea here is you're mimicking an epiphyte's growth habit to grow in air. Simple. Uh, very simple. Um, and uh, we power. So, this, so that's why we, I call it an air pot, because basically it's just air, plastic brace, and, you, and you're strapping this thing into, because another thing with this is, when you transplant it like this, there's gonna be shock, right? Broken roots and all of this stuff. You don't want it moving around, because when the roots start to grow, you don't want it moving. The roots are not gonna do well with this moving. So you clamp it and make sure everything is, and then just leave it alone for a while. And if, if you have time, you can come up and take a look. Like some of these are relatively new. You can see the new roots are growing from the old roots and the growing tips and all of that. As long as it's clamped down, it doesn't move, <coughs> it'll continue to grow. Okay, so, so, so in, in summary, really, panda is real easy to grow because they're epiphytes and they grow on trees and stuff, the specialized roots. All you do is really give them air. You try to mimic this air thing for bandas. Again, they like light, fertilizer, and water. So if you give them maximum allowable light, give them fertilizer and water regularly, they'll bloom. What happens when they get to be 12 feet tall or 12 feet tall? Well, I've had I have one Luzonica that was seven feet tall oh. before it threw a cake. See, so the only time I chop it is if get cakey or roots start coming up. I had one that was very happy growing was. So I moved it into a little bit brighter place and then it started freaking out a little and roots started coming up. So if it starts to get too big, stress it. And what will happen... It's past my familiar top of my well, You know, in, I know people who have vandals growing in their yard and the thing just crawls over trees and stuff. So it can grow really, really long. What we're doing here is artificial. We're forcing them to do what we want it to do. Right? <laughs> but if you let it alone, it grows like crazy. Yeah, because yeah, it's like, my tree's about 15 feet. It's actually above my tree. <laughs> well, you know, there's, there's this one vanda that's actually become a weed and a tricolor. It's actually, it, apparently pollination occurs and this, it's spreading. So the vandas can be a weed. Well, this is a renethera. Yeah. So it's just a big guy. <laughs> well, renetheras actually get huge, yeah. Yeah, it is. I, I, had, I had one that was seven feet, too. Yeah. But, I, you know, I try to I try to cut them and make them smaller, mm -hmm. and man, more manageable. Well, mm -hmm. it, it did throw a cakey below, yeah. but, you know, it threw the cakey at three feet, but it's still 15 feet. Yeah. <laughs> and, if the roots are, if it's 15 feet tall and the roots start at, at 10 feet, not so bad, right? It's bad when it's, mine was like seven feet and never roots except on the bottom. So you kind of just, if there's no roots like here, you can just chop this off in the middle and <laughs> expect it to grow. It's not going to do very well. You got to wait till the roots come out. So if it's like up here, you can't just chop it and transplant it. It's not going to, 
be very happy. You gotta wait for the roots to come out and then you can actually cut it. Two or three roots, you can cut it and then it begins to grow. So, so two or three roots is all you need? Two or three roots is what I use to go by. Um, more is better, but um, sometimes you can't wait. They get too big otherwise, right? So, mm -hmm. And again, the idea is um, you need to make enough room so that you can buy more plants. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. What about pests and how do you treat it? Um, Vandas remarkably are resistant to many diseases. Biggest problem I have with Vandas is flower insects, thrips, um, midges. mites kind of thing, midges, midges, flower midges. And so I, I spray regularly. Um, they have this thing they sell at gardening shops called the three bears, three in one, right? Yeah. That's mites and, and thrips. Mm -hmm. But you, well, there's another thing. You cannot always spread the same thing over and over again. The birds will get uh, accustomed to it. So I mix that with uh, horticultural oil, and then there's the um, soap that they have, the uh, horticultural soap that you can also use. The oil and soap are contact insecticides, so you gotta spray them on the bugs. The three-in-one is a systemic, so you can actually get more, uh, more control in addition to three and one, I rec would recommend, if you're getting really serious, more serious, is orthene. Uh, orthene is a systemic insecticide that has a different control mechanism than the three and one, so it kills bugs that the three and one doesn't kill. So if you mix those, you'll get a better kill. But again, the oil and the soap kills a lot of stuff, but it's a contact insecticide, so you gotta catch it actually on the plant, yes. When you say mix, are you mixing it together or are you just using one, one week and the other? Oh, no, 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 yes. I don't I mean yeah. mixing together. I mean alternating, not okay. mixing, but alternating. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mixing in my spray schedule, but alternating in application. Oh, wow. Are you gonna say you can't put oil and the sulfur together? That's bad. No, 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 no. <laughs> Although, you can mix certain insecticides and fungicides, they're compatible. But you need to check to make sure they're compatible. Mm -hmm. So I do mix some, like I mix, I mix morphine with uh, the 3236 of Cleary, which is a systemic fungicide. And that way I get control with that. So it, you can do that too. But. Why um, not you mix Dacanil and Yeah. So there's a, different, there's a bunch of different mixes you can follow. Do. But the idea here is if you have an insect problem, you cannot only use one thing all the time because it eventually won't work. Okay. You've got to mix. You gotta change it and alternate mm -hmm. and try to make it with something that controls the insect in a different way. That's why they are like the orthene versus the three. Yeah, like a stomach poison versus a yeah. parasite. Right, right. Then nowadays uh, insecticides are are so sophisticated that they attack the insect in different ways. Right. So you gotta know which way it's doing that. Okay. Any other questions? What about fungus? Excuse me? Fungus, are they prone to fungus? You know, um, they do have fungal spots, but it really doesn't affect anything other than what it looks like. So it doesn't, I've not seen it really kill it, although sometimes it has a tip, a crown, a tip rot. The very growing tip might die. But when that happens, it'll throw a cake in. So sometimes it's a good thing, because all of a sudden now you get plenty of cake coming up, but the tip will die. So yeah, it fung some fungus, I think it's a fungus anyway, it turns they, black. They get yeah. They get yeah. But uh, um, mostly it's black spots, fungal spots. I apply fungicides though. Okay. So that might be one of the reasons I don't have that much of an issue. But if I, the three in one has a fungicide in it, I apply other fungicides also. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, could you plant that in a smaller box? Yes. Since you, but you don't have enough room at your house? I could, but that means I have to transplant more often because it'll all go to pot quicker. Now, right now, a pot of this size, I can usually leave it in this pot until it's too tall. But if the pot was smaller, I would probably have to transplant it when it's not that tall. So for me, this is a good size because by the time it outgrows the pot, the thing is big and bulky anyway. And so it, 
And usually it has roots coming out the middle, so I can chop it and transplant it. Do so a lot of people buy those plants? <coughs> buy these kind of plants? Yeah. Yeah, I see them on sale regularly, mm -hmm. I suppose. So um, you can grow it small and then sell it and then get more room for the plants. Oh, yeah. But you know, know. <laughs> they're, they're not that easy to propagate because they don't make that many cases from the plants. It, it, yes, yeah. most of most of the time, especially if they're happy. If you stress them, they tend to be hating more. I have a friend, greenhouse and wine are just rows and rows of hanging vandas, huge. But he has the luxury of his huge greenhouse, right? And you get little, huge vandas, just all the roots hanging out. I cannot do that. I mean, I, my, my this greenhouse that I grow my vandas in is 10 feet by 30 inches. <laughs> I'm doing this kind of thing. Right, so I cannot, I cannot do that. I mean, I can barely fit this in. <laughs> but then, but then it's this long. It's like not. Nah, it's got to go outside. It's too big. So. I have, like I said, my eyes are bigger than my greenhouse. So. My problem is space. So when you water, do you water focused on the roots or the whole? I water the whole plant. Okay. Um, again, when I fertilize, I fertilize the whole plant. So when you fertilize the whole plant, you got to water the whole plant because the fertilizer will be in here. Yeah. yeah. You don't want that. Right? Because actually I heard from other growers that the vendor can absorb nutrients from in here too. Oh, okay. So that's why they recommended fertilizing the whole plant. I didn't know that, so they told me that, and so I did that. But because I do that, I got I to water the whole yeah. plant. Yeah. So you would fertilize first and then water later? I fertilize on Saturdays. My, the process of fertilization for me is I water everything, then I fertilize, and then Sunday I, I water again. I leave it overnight, fertilize it there, then I water again and flush it. But I do that every week, so it gets a little bit every week. My grass grows really green. <laughs> the mango tree that my neighbor's roots come on grows really green. But, but again, Orchids are, are um, sensitive to salts. All fertilizers are salts. So they need fertilizer, but you put too much and they, they actually get tip burns and stuff like that. So you gotta give a fertilizer, but then you have to flush the excess. The nature of development is it, it absorbs the nutrients, right? So overnight, it absorbs the nutrients and then I flush it away. Now, some people think I'm crazy. My wife says I'm OCD. <laughs> I, I just think I'm a dedicated hobbyist, kind of, right? Yeah, right. So p other people don't do it the same way I do. They leave it, the fertilizer, for a week. So, mm -hmm. Like they fertilize, and then they'll water for a while. Um, but, because, <coughs> and, but they don't fertilize every week also. Mm -hmm. okay. So the combination okay. of fertilizer timing and flushing is, it all, is relative to each other. So for each system that you set up, you need to come understand that your fertilizer schedule and your watering schedule has to has to coincide. So that's why I flush as much as I do. But can I use like manure tea? You can. Um, I, I used to use uh, manure tea and add it. And actually I do still. Once a month I add the um, plant growth enhancer that they sell in a little bottle for like $30 for a little bottle, four drops per gallon of water. So it's, it's a, what's that? Super Thrive? Super Thrive. Yes, no, no, it's like Super Thrive, but it's not Super Thrive. It they matter. sell it um, in some of the garden shops. It's called Plant Growth Enhancer. I think it's an Island Supreme product. It is four drops per gallon of water. I had that once a month. It's a, it's a manure tea. To, I do it for the um, micronutrients. The EM? EM1? No, I use the EM1 also as an additive. <laughs> EM1 is a microbial uh, additive. Yeah. It's microbes. Manure tea is a fertilizer. Mm -hmm. EM1 is a microbial enhancement. So it's two different things. Yeah. But I, I use that too. Okay. Yes? Um, how do you spray, how do you water or fertilize your plants? you use a sprayer? I use a pump sprayer, two, uh, one gallon sprayer. So you spray the whole thing? And I spray it, yeah. Okay. So you um, water before you fertilize? Yes, it's important. You water some before don't. because you want the roots wet. Mm -hmm. 
If you apply fertilizer to a dry root, it might get burned on the leaves and stuff. So you water first, make sure it's wet, then you apply the fertilizer, and then, then I flush it. So. so you're watering three times a day? You're well, fertilizing and then watering again? Well, the, the next day, the next day, but yeah. But there's some the plants I water every day anyway. Like these I water every day. So yeah. Okay. But that's just, <laughs> yeah. Last Sorry. question for the mic. When you get the flowers that already, when you fertilize and you spray, you spray all the flowers? Or? No, not the flowers. I try to avoid the flowers doing watering and fertilizing. Oh, yeah. But I, when I spray, I spray the buds yeah. for the insecticides and stuff. I try not to spray the flower, yeah. but hey, you know, you, you probably get some of it on there, but you don't want to put fertilizer on the flowers as much. And actually, you want to not get the flowers wet if you can avoid it too. You get botrytis spotting if they get wet. You try not to. Sorry, hold on, hold on, the same thing too. You mm -hmm. cannot get the rainwater or any water for some, especially the white. Oh, the too. Yeah. So, do you? Now you don't want it. flowering plants. Any more questions? Do you, Larry, do you do you fertilize it if it's already in flower or when they're not in flower? I fertilize it all the time. All the time. Does it matter? No. Some people say that I shouldn't do that, but to me. I apply fertilizer to make sure that the, the nutrition level is constant. And uh, that allows maximum flowering, um, in my way of thinking, maximum flowering based on nutrition. Yeah. So the other factors then would be affecting flowering like light and water. But I, I, I flower, I mean I flower, I fertilize every week and um, whether or not it's flowering or, or anything. Do they have a dormancy period? I haven't noticed that in Vandas. Now, um, mm -hmm. they slow down in growth in the wintertime. I think the cold temperature yeah. makes them grow slower than the winter. Summertime, they grow faster. And um, you could probably increase the fertilization there, too. I don't. <coughs> My wife said I'm OCD because I do the same thing all the time. But right? so, <laughs> so I think it's consistency. So. Anyway, that's my excuse anyway. <laughs> all right, everyone, that's going to be it for tonight's video. I hope you all enjoyed it. Please keep in mind that what works for Larry may not necessarily work for you. So take everything that was said with a grain of salt. I'd like to say a really big mahalo to Larry for allowing me to record him tonight so that I could share this video with all of you. I also have an announcement to make. Our club is going to be having a Mother's Day event on Saturday, May 13th from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Mililani Uka Elementary School. So please save that date and come out and support local. Until next time, everyone, remember to always live aloha.